get it stringing in there. It's time for the Chapter and Chapter yeah. Cafe with Camden County Library District Director, Professor Jim Paisley. Yeah. Myself and uh, Professor Jim Paisley, and we are here with the Chapter, Chapter, and Chatter Cafe, promoting the Camden County Library District, and we're certainly glad to have you with us if you're watching online. Thank you so much. We've got some folks in the house with us here. We're at the Camdenton branch of the CCLD, and I want to start, Jim, by first, <clears throat> of course, saying that this is going to be a great opportunity for you and I to get together and promote this uh, great library district and all that it uh, offers. As a matter of fact, we've got uh, a lot of folks we want to thank here to start this because this has been a pretty incredible journey. It has been. It has been. And I'll tell you what, I couldn't be more proud of the staff and all the help we've gotten from the community to make this happen. So. We, uh, of course, want to thank uh, a lot of the folks that have been behind the scenes with us helping us out. Uh, Coley Creech and uh, Mark Massey, and of course, uh, Vicki Graneman, who's uh, been uh, so, uh, what's a good word to use there? What's a good word? On the air? Yes, yeah. okay. yes, yeah. yes. She's been wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> She's been a delight to work with, and we want to thank everybody for joining us. If you're streaming it on YouTube, if you're streaming it on Facebook, as I said, we have some folks in the house, and we want to thank everybody for coming in. Also, we want to thank some of our uh, partners in crime, as he would say. Uh, they include our good friends at SRG Financial Advisors, Bill and Janice Lacasse and their staff, and uh, thanks to uh, William Holtz and the uh, staff at Lake TV for producing our intro, and we thank everyone for supporting us as well. It's just a good opportunity for you to uh, learn a little bit more where, uh, where your tax dollars are going. Absolutely. This is a great opportunity. We're going to be talking very soon with Professor Jim Paisley. He and I have been doing this for quite a while. Uh, we're, uh, we're going to talk, talk uh, the, history, the history, again, again history, history of immigration, immigration and we, we hope that, that uh, you understand that this is the history of immigration. Of immigration. We're, we're not going to really get into the politics today. today. We'll also we'll have an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, some of the events going on throughout Camden, Camden County, County and the Camden, Camden County Library District. District. There's uh, this eclipse coming up. And so a lot of people would like to know more about it. And you can actually find out more through your Camden, Camden County Library, Library District, District uh, the, the various libraries, the branches are going to be holding events. We'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about uh, genealogy, genealogy, which is something, something directly related, related to what we're talking about. about. And, and we'll have, have a segment, segment uh, for you as well, well kind of a Q&A. &A. So, so for you folks out there that are here in, uh, in our uh, audience today, if you have some questions related to uh, Jim's topics, feel free to uh, write those down. We'll give you some three by five cards. You can write the questions down and then we'll answer those questions. For those of you that are streaming online, we can also take an opportunity to hear from you. You can uh, submit your questions online and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. Again, we'll do that with about 10 minutes remaining in the program. So uh, of course, a lot is always in the news about immigration. So you, sir, have done your homework as you always do and you have made this uh, a very interesting topic to, uh, to start us off. It is. It's, uh, it's a real fascinating topic, and uh, we, you know, we constantly get to see the talking heads on the news at night, and half the time, you kind of, when they get done, you kind of walk away and say, I wonder what, what that was all about, right? But one of the interesting things is, you know, we, we talk about promoting the library, and I was doing a little research ahead of time, and, and the Pew Research Firm did some, some research on the future of libraries and where they're headed. And they did a poll, or asking a lot of people, so what's your biggest issue right now with the libraries? And surprisingly, the number one answer, number one, was that people wished they, were, they had been more aware of what the libraries are doing, mm -hmm. what programs they have, what facilities they have, uh, you know, just all of it. And so having done that research and taking on this, this job as the new director, I thought, we need to pursue that. We need to see what we can do to promote what's here at the library because it's it's blown me away since I got here. I got to be honest with you. I'm I'm that old school where you had the had the, the old lady in the back of the room going Shh, all the time, you know, and, and nothing but books. And now, I mean, everything from 3D printers to 
uh, all kinds of, uh, of, of electronic data that comes in. Uh, all, just, it's amazing. I mean, and we'll talk some more about that as we, as we get into the program. I found this to be a very interesting facility, and for those of you who don't know about it, uh, I think you need to come down and learn. Wherever you live in Camden County, there's a branch close to you. But more importantly, the amount of things that are available here. Obviously, you're going to come in, you're going to find books, lots of books. That's what a library is traditionally known for. But as you mentioned, 3D printers, you've got musical instruments in the back if people are interested in that. Plenty of games, plenty of activities. You've got opportunities for people to come in and research things with the, the internet. You've got the, the adult area, and when I say adult area, I mean for adults. Uh, and then you've got the kids area where you've got Got the little tiny chairs for the kids. And, and, and it's really cool for you to come in. And if you haven't been in your local library, no matter where you're watching this from, take the opportunity to stop by and check it out because I would imagine that most of this is available because, as you mentioned, the, the struggle for libraries has always been keeping up and certainly keeping up with technology in this day and age. And the Camden County Library District does a phenomenal job of doing just that. So without further ado, let's turn it over to the good professor and get our history, again, history of immigration. So immigration, what a mess, right? Right now, it couldn't be a more controversial topic than any that you could pick. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I, when I mentioned to the staff that that was the topic I was going to choose. Everybody kind of rolled their eyes and like, oh boy, here we go. But what most people don't realize is we have a really deep history on this issue of immigration. I mean, we're, we're a country made of immigrants. And so our forefathers looked at this from the get-go. And I, I think it's fascinating in the fact that they're sitting there setting down rules as to who could come into the country when they came in here themselves. They were immigrants. And so uh, the people who were actually making the laws, uh, once they got here, they realized, oh, my gosh, there's a bunch of people in the line behind me, and they're coming from everywhere. So what are we going to do about that? And again, the first immigrants coming here were from Europe. That's where most of the people were coming from. And a lot of it was because in the 1800s, there were all sorts of different uh, revolutions that took place in the 1830s, 50s, and 70s. And it, People would always say, well, we're going to America for the opportunity. Well, <laughs> I can tell you right now, coming here, I mean, it was a wilderness. I mean, it was brutal. And, you know, there had to be something driving them here. We, when we look at our genealogy, we have a tendency to say, well, we're doing this, we're going there because it, it's an opportunity. But in reality, if you're doing your genealogy, look and see what was happening, where the people came from. Because nine times out of ten, they had a terrible situation at home. It was religious persecution. It was uh, no opportunities, inflation. There was uh, a tyrant running the country. So people were fleeing something back there, all right? Because like I say, when you got here, it's wilderness. There was nothing, okay? So here we go. We start in, and as the people come to America, uh, you know, the first ones that got here, they started seeing more and more people following them, and they started looking at it and realized, wait a minute, the people that are coming here, I don't remember them as being, you know, the, the upper crust of society. And what they found out was is that once we established uh, a foothold here uh, coming out of Europe, most of the countries sent their ne'er-do-wells. They sent convicts and prostitutes and... You know, I know this comes as a shock. Not everybody came on the Mayflower. It wasn't that big a boat, okay? And so a lot of times when you do your genealogy, you'll go all the way back and think, oh, good grief, you know? Yeah, find out that, you know, they got out of debtor's prison. They had things called debtor's prison back then, you know? And if you couldn't make your payments, they threw you in, in jail. Well, then, if you're in jail, how do you make your payments, right? I mean, it's kind of like some of the cars I owned when I was 16. You know, you're thinking, well, I'm in debt, big time, right? And thank God they didn't have it back then. I'd, I'd have spent life in prison for some of the loans that I had. On Most of us would be in debtor's prison yes, exactly. at some point, right. sure. Well, what happened was is that as we got here, we saw that there were two major groups that were coming here. They were convicts and then, of course, slaves. And the big issue with, with the slaves was is they needed them as a labor force. And that wasn't just in the South, that was throughout the colonies. 
And we also had people called indentured servants. These people uh, would agree to come and work for somebody for like five years uh, on a farm or something to pay off their passage to actually get here. And so everybody was, it was a diverse group to say the least. Now, <clears throat> basically what happened was, is the colonies were fighting against English parliamentary law that said it's perfectly fine to empty out your prisons and send everybody to America. Just get them out of here, okay? And we were thinking, you know, do we really want a country full of ne'er-do-wells? And so, sure enough, our forefathers got together and said, we need to do something. Now, there's another group we need to talk about, and that was the Native Americans, which I think is pretty humorous because when we came over here, we ran into the Native Americans who at first thought, yeah, great, come on in, we're happy to see you. But they, we'd come in and say, we discovered you. And the Indians are looking at one another going, wait, I've been here all along. We discovered you, right? It was the other way around. So, you know, an interesting dynamic. Now, what our forefathers struggled with was once they got here, there was a ruling class. Uh, they called them wasps, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And those folks basically, once they established control and had most of the major uh, properties, most of the land, they decided, well, we need to figure out what we're going to do about all the other people coming behind us. And now, all of a sudden, you had a difference of opinion. Should the country let everybody come in? Or should we try and control it to maintain what we have? Okay? And it led to the first political party. It was called the Federalists. And the Federalists, they were having a real problem with all these immigrants coming in. And particularly uh, when we got, uh, once we established the country and the French Revolution broke out, they were afraid, oh my goodness, we're going to have, have people coming from France that might come in here and start a revolution here. And so now they're concerned about that. So they're, so they're concerned, concerned about, about all the different types of people that are coming into the country. And <clears throat> so they passed the first immigration law, and that was back in 1795. 1795, and pay attention to these dates because it's pretty fascinating when you look at it. And it was called the naturalization law, and they said you have to live here two to five years before we'll let you be a citizen. So you can get here, but it's going to be at least two to five years before we'll let you be a citizen. Now, in 1798, the Federalists came to power politically, and with that, they changed the residence requirement to 14 years. You had to be here 14 years before you could become a citizen, and that, that was an act signed by John Adams. Now, these allows, all laws also allowed the president to deport any immigrant who he believed posed a threat to national security. I'm going to say that again. Think about this. This is 1798. The president could deport anybody he saw as a threat. Okay? So when we hear things like that today, we're like, oh, we'd never do that. Sure we did. We did it in 1798. All right? Now, what happened next was in 1800, the Democratic Party came to power. Can you imagine politics having anything to do with immigration? But there it was. So the Federalists are out. The Democrats come in. And when, sure enough, under Thomas Jefferson, he comes in and he says, hey, he said, we need to turn around and fix this. This is, this is a mess. Because what had happened under Adams, they passed something called the Alien and Sedition Act. And when they did that, what they did, it was kind of interesting. They said, okay, a political party was in charge, and they added an amendment to it. You know how that works, right? They added an amendment and said, oh, by the way, you know, this 14-year thing. Also, it's illegal for anybody to say anything bad about the president. And if you say anything bad about him, we'll arrest you. Well, that only took place, only, only held in place. They made that part of the rule only last till March because they figured that'll keep all the political opposition quiet until the election takes place. Well, it didn't work. Okay, the Federalists were out. Here comes Jefferson with his part. And so, first thing he does is he did away with that, but he kept the 14 year requirement. Okay? Now, <clears throat> after a while, they started looking at it more and more, and they thought, 14 years is crazy. And so Jefferson came back and changed it to five years again, rolled it back, and that five years is what, where we are today. Okay? Now, <clears throat> basically, 
And what we saw happen next is in the 19th century, in the 1800s, there's a huge wave of immigrants coming, European immigrants, and they're all coming because they're fleeing something back in Europe. And like I say, there were all kinds of revolutions in the 30s, 50s, and 70s, so here they come. Now, a lot of them were Irish and German. The Irish fled because they had something called the potato famine. All of their, their food supply had dried up, and so they're starving to death. And they hopped on a boat and came here. And a lot of these po people were indentured servants. In other words, they came over here to work farms here in America so that they could pay off the debt for the passage to get here. Then you had the Germans. Now, the Germans, they went through this whole thing with Martin Luther and the Protestant Revolution and all of that. So you, the country was basically divided Catholic and Protestant. And so what happened is the Protestants eventually made it life miserable for the Catholics, so the Catholics all loaded up and came here. And so again, keep in mind that a lot of people are coming here because they're fleeing something back home. That's the way it worked. Now, what we saw happen next is Congress saw their naturalization law, and they looked at it and said, this two, two to five years maybe would be a better way to think about letting people come in. Now, as we, as we proceeded down, down this course of events, we saw two things. First, we had jobs. That was the number, the number one thing. We got here in the industrial age, in the 1800s. I mean, we're doing great. And the industry is expanding, so as people came here, everybody had a job. The other issue was, do we have enough land? Well, with the Louisiana Purchase, we got the whole Western Territory. We wanted people then. We were encouraging people to come here because we didn't have any way to inhabit all the territory where we're standing right now, part of the Louisiana Purchase here in Missouri. The issue was, is that we needed people. And we had jobs, and we didn't have anybody to take the jobs. So we were encouraging people to come here. All right. Now, this is where the central theme of this whole talk is about. When we need people, we ask them to come. But when all of a sudden they're all here and we don't need them anymore, guess what we do? Uh, bye, we need to change this law and get them out of here. And so that became a huge issue for us, a huge issue. All right. Now, basically, the, the Congress, our, our congressmen, they got together. And what do you think they did? They formed a committee. <laughs> now, you know how that works, right? Well, they formed this committee, the Congressional Select Committee, in 1838, and they said our, their job was to uh, do away with the threat uh, to our peace and tranquility as citizens, referring to the immigrants. Now, <clears throat> they even went so far in their, in their rec congressional record to say that these immigrants are paupers and vagrants and mal malefactors sent hither at the expense of foreign governments to relieve them of their burden of their maintenance. In other words, they're sending us to people that they don't want to take care of. And this, again, think about that, 1838. So does any of this sound familiar to you? Right? Now, in 1875, Congress passed an exclusion law. Yes, we actually passed a law that banned convicts and prostitutes. Now, how they did that back in 1875 to figure out what your record was or, you know, whatever is beyond me, you know. But sure enough, if they suspected, you're not coming in, all right? We also had political parties formed. We had groups called the Order of the Star Spangled Banner and the Know Nothing Party who were totally opposed to any type of immigration at all, letting anybody in. They wanted to just close the borders completely. Now, between 1860 and 1915, another wave of European immigrants started coming in. Now we're getting Russia, we're getting Austria, we're getting Italy. All of these folks are coming in. And like I say, if you go back and look, in the mid-1800s is when most of your ancestors came here, folks. That's, that's when they came, okay? Well, Congress now decided that we've got to do something even more. And they said, we're going to put another restriction on it. You have to take a medical exam, a medical exam, and have no criminal record to come here. All right? Now, bear in mind, folks, this is in the 19, early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s. You had to take a medical exam to come in here to be a, be a citizen. There was a big shock. That was. It was amazing, you know. And in 1891, they had an act that barred people living or people coming in who had any contagious history of any contagious diseases or a history of crime. 
Now, bear in mind, these are Europeans, okay? And you had all kinds of, you know, COVID was, COVID was small compared to some of the plagues and everything else, the diseases that they had in Europe. So if you had any record of having been sick, sorry, not going to happen, all right? Then in 1903, the people of the United States had gotten so fear, fearful of these European radicals coming in, and basically that they said, all right, we're going to pass another act, and it was called the Subversive Act uh, that basically looked at uh, any kind of anarchists or radicals or anybody coming in, and this was an, it had been enacted in 1891, it said, if you have any ties to any of that. So you can see uh, our forefathers themselves were putting all of these restrictions on immigration, all right? Now, in addition to that, they said, well, obviously this sickness thing and all the rest of it's not doing the job. Let's go with a literacy test. A literacy test. So now you come in there, now bear in mind, you know, your background, you know, let's say you're Italian. You come in there, you don't speak a word of English. And they gave you a test in English. I think you failed, right? Pretty much. And so basically, the literacy test eliminated people from get, being able to come to America as well. So we've got medical exams, literacy tests, you name it. You can't be a convict, you can't have, you know, all your background checks, boom, all right? So we're making it pretty hard to come to America, all right? Now in 1924, they came up with another idea, the Quota Act, all right? It was the Origins Act is what they called it. But in essence, what they did is they said, okay, we're gonna take the total number of Irishmen in the United States, and we'll take a percentage of that. Let's say there's 10,000 of them. We'll take 2% of the number of Irishmen in the United States, that's the number that we'll let in every year, okay? So, and they did that for every ethnic group. So they put restrictions on how many of them could actually come in, all right? Now we get to the next big group, and that was the Chinese. Guess what? We have all these jobs, we need people, and particularly on the West Coast, California, and so California is promoting the Chinese to come in. We need you in the fishing industry, we need you to help us build the railroad and all of this. And when they did that, all of a sudden, here they come. I mean, there's gazillions of them coming in. They've got an overpopulation and bad economy in China, so they all come to America. When they get here, all of a sudden, somebody turned around and said, look at all these Chinese folks. And guess what? They were better workers than ours. They took over the fishing industry, literally took it over. And all of a sudden, the people in California are going, hold it, time out, we got to do something. And so what did they do? They turned around and created the Chinese Exclusion Act. They said, we don't want them anymore. And they excluded them, and we cut them off altogether. No Chinese allowed, okay? No soup for you. And one of the big problems that they had is, is about the time the Chinese are coming in, they're doing, they discovered gold in California. Well, guess well, what? Guess the Chinese what? would work day and night digging these mines out. They're making a lot of money at it. And they said, okay, we're going to ban them from mining as well, the ones that are here. So, again, you know, you sit there and scratch your head sometimes. You know what's interesting about all of this is it seems like there wasn't a whole lot of forethought put in place. None. It's like we need people, but we only need them to a certain degree. And once they become unnecessary, they've served their purpose then it's time to get rid of them. But then how do you do that? How do you effectively do that? In this day and age, it would seem with technology that might be a little bit easier. But as we know, there's still plenty of people that get under the radar. Back then, I mean, wouldn't they almost have to go out and literally hunt them down? They did. They went out and hunted them down. And if you, you were a Chinaman walking down the streets, they'd lock you up, they'd grab you, and they'd ship you back to California, put you on a boat, and you're out of here. And they. It, it got to be such a, a big program that in 1902, California, California, all right, they passed the Chinese, uh, passed another act that basically banned all Chinese. 1902, they said to be here as a Chinaman, you, they are permanently illegal. Any of them that show up, put them on a boat, send them right back. Okay, so if you, based on their ethnicity, we would not let them in the country, all right? So the question that begs asking here, and maybe we can address it in detail a little bit later on in the program, but then for those people that had traveled all this way, only to find out that they weren't wanted or they weren't allowed in this country, did they do something similar to what we're seeing now 
they came in anyway. And they came in around these ports or <laughs> these places that were put in place to stop them. What happened back then, very quickly, word got back to China, don't go there. Mm -hmm. That's not the place to go. And so it basically cut off all that immigration coming in. Right. Now, again, we brought the Chinese in to help us build the Transcontinental Railroad. But once it was done, we didn't need the labor anymore. Now, what I find interesting is this next piece on Mexico, because that's a big issue. We had the Mexican-American War in 1849, and in essence, what happened is we wound up with California, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, parts of Colorado, Utah, and Nevada. Well, when we won that war, that was Mexico. Those, those places were part of Mexico. And we told the people, you know, we won the war, you're now part of America. If you want to go back to Mexico, that's fine. They're saying, I've lived here my whole life. So there they are. They're, they are Americans, all right? because we, we brought them in, all right? They were already here. Now, <clears throat> basically what we ran into is that Mexican immigration after the war rose extremely. Uh, in 1900 to 1930, we saw all of these people immigrating from Mexico to America, and again, the reason why, this is a roaring 20s, folks. You know, there's jobs everywhere, and we need the labor. So we're welcoming them with open arms. Come on in, we, we really want you. Right? And, and so, so sure, sure enough, we brought them in and, and we were using them in all of our factories and all. But then what happened? The Great Depression. And when the Great Depression hit, there weren't any jobs for any of us. And so the first thing they did is said, well, first thing we need to do is get rid of all those Mexicans, right? Because, you know, they're not part of, the, part of the whole group anyhow, including the ones that were there when the war took place. And they, we, they literally went to them and said, back to Mexico. And they're saying, we've been three generations here in Colorado. No, sorry, you're out. And so we did the same thing to the Mexicans that we did with the Chinese. We used them until we didn't need them anymore, all right? Well, now we come out of that whole situation. And in 1942, after, the, after we, you know, been through the Depression and all, in 42, now we're on, in the war years. We need people to work in the factories. And we didn't have them. So what did we do? Went back to Mexico. We need more people. And they created something called the Bracero Program. It's B-R-A-C-E-R-O. And Congress passed this. And basically what we did is we recruited Mexicans to come to America to work in all of our factories to help us through the war years, right? And so we are actually recruiting them to come in here. Now bear in mind, this is in 42, guys. And here we are today, we're saying, well, oh, we don't want any of them. So again, the pendulum swings constantly here in America. And so what we saw happen is it was John F. Kennedy who turned around and said, we need to look at this whole immigration thing. And he said, what we'll do is we'll create this system that allows immigrants into the country based on family ties and special skills. In other words, if we need them, we're bringing them in, all right? The act was actually signed by President Johnson, who signed it into law. But this 1965 act allowed huge masses of immigrants from Mexico and South America to come in because we needed the labor force. Does that make sense? So you can see, you know, if, if you look, if you step back and look at this whole program, what happened here was, you know, we hear today and say, well, oh, we'd never do that, or we've never done this. Well, all you got to do is go back and look at your history. And you can see we have been both sides of this whole issue of immigration all the way back to the founding of our country. And so it's a great topic. And the idea behind these shows is to pique your interest. And I hope that's what I've done. We've actually, in each one of our libraries, we have, have pulled books from the shelves. There is a display right here with some of the books available. Uh, that You can do your own research. You know, and, and as far as politically, I'm Switzerland. I'm giving you the history. And like I say, I hope this has piqued your interest where you can go back, to your, go to your local library. All six of them are doing this. They're pulling the books, having them for every topic that we discuss. Mm -hmm. And you can do your own research on these things because all of them are just fascinating stories to me. And again, as always, I think people can refer to your website, ccld.us. 
It's a uh, very informative website. It's a, you know, we're going to get into the genealogy aspect uh, as far as immigration is concerned, but I think it's important to understand and realize that the whole focus on what we're dealing with now as far as immigration is the hope that people don't look back and they don't do their research and they don't look into the history because if they did, they'd be uh, horrified by, by what they come across. And, and that's the whole thing. I mean, folks, in this day and age we live in where technology kind of rules the roost, we're so apt to pick up a phone or get a laptop and sit down and just kind of follow the direction of what the media is telling you. And I would hope at some point that somebody steps in and says, listen, the whole purpose of what we're doing here is to sway people's decisions one way or the other, whether it's a presidential race, whether it's something in a state that borders Mexico, for example. The hope is to generate enough emotion and tug at those emotional heartstrings that people don't stop and go, well, maybe we should look back. Maybe we should take an opportunity to learn about what it is that has happened in this country. Because we didn't just wake up one day and the United States was all put together and well-formed and uh, you know, well-oiled machine to some degree. I guess there's a lot of people that would uh, possibly debate the use of that particular phrase, well-oiled machine. However, that's what we want to do. And through your Camden County Library District and the various branches, six of them as a matter of fact, you can go and you can form your own opinions and you can come up with your own answers and you can see how this country was formed based on some things that we would see today and it would just virtually blow our minds to know that we did offer people an opportunity to come here but there were a lot of uh, strings attached now maybe not so much and we look at it and say well you know why don't you just let them come in or why don't we keep them out i mean whatever your take is on that particular argument but we're not here to get into that today however just some of the things that we've talked about. And we'll address some of these questions and maybe some questions that our audience has here or for folks that are uh, watching this uh, on Facebook or on YouTube. But it is such a fascinating topic and there is so much to it. And I think that's the most important point. And what you do and will continue to do is to break this down so that maybe people decide what I'm hearing on whatever news source I, I read or use, get, yeah. Get the talking heads to watch this show. Talking heads out there, please pay attention. You know, Feel do, free to do your uh, yeah, your, do your research. research. Right. And I can give you some books. I can give you some research here. You can do your own research. And, and maybe, you know, then you won't sit there after you say something and look off stage and go, what did I just say, right? Yeah. So. It's amazing when you think about it because of the fact that history as we've told folks, uh, Jim and I, you and I have a long history of doing these types of shows where we take a topic that is in the here and now, that's relatable to everyone. And with a little research, you can find out how this has come about to where it is today. And how, when we think of people, uh, obviously back then they thought of people more or less as tools, you know, or, or cogs in a wheel. And when you no longer need a cog or the cog is broken, you replace it with something else. But the way they went about doing it is what I find so fascinating. To literally ban an entire race of people. Because we don't need you anymore. We're done. And this was See you later, bye. You didn't hear me say anything about executive orders, did you? No. No. Congress is the one that was making these laws. And here again, you kind of wonder how many, how many people in Congress today know the history of Congress in dealing with immigration. That's another big issue. Well, and I think also on top of it, when you think about just exactly what it is we're discussing here today and how you use people like you would use a hammer or a screwdriver, and when you don't need it, instead of putting it back in the toolbox to use it again, you basically throw it away. Or you just ban it. Screwdrivers, hammers, they're, they're no longer necessary. They're no longer in existence. So. I would, uh, I would question a lot of our leaders today because now you are elected to office and in most cases you're trying to get reelected. 
So you think now not necessarily about what it is that people are dealing with and how it directly affects them. You're thinking about how I lay the groundwork to be reelected. And so maybe history doesn't necessarily make uh, any difference to these folks because they're not at all concerned about it. They just want to get uh, people behind them for one reason or another. And we see that all the time. Sometimes it works, sometimes not so much. And then occasionally you have that person that comes along and wants to be the trailblazer that maybe has done their research or they know enough about a particular topic that they can actually inform people. Well, then that person is ostracized and kicked to the curb and made to look like a fool or an idiot or they do some sort of a background check on them and they find that they've done something horrible in their life, right? If I was in Congress, I would just bring him the history. I'd say, here it is. Here's what you did before, right? And, 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 and really, again, without getting too political, folks, accountability is so important. When you elect someone and they run on a particular uh, platform, and then once they get to the land of milk and honey and realize that's more important than what's going on back in my uh, congressional district in Missouri, whether it's on the state level or the federal level, yeah, maybe we start getting a little bit more uh, along the lines of trying to hold people's feet to the fire. And we certainly ask our, uh, our informers, uh, the mainstream media, to uh, do, a little bit of, uh, do a little bit of a better job in letting people know what, what has actually happened. So immigration has been an issue since 1795, and we still don't have an answer. So, We're, but we have the answers here at our libraries. So come on in. Do your research. Maybe you'll be the one that changes all of it. CCLD.us is also the website that you can uh, refer to if you'd like to find out more and uh, ask general questions or to find out if there is uh, some information on a particular topic available if you can't make it in right away. But we certainly invite you to take an opportunity to come out and certainly see what your local library is all about. Camden County Library District, uh, your tax dollars at work, and uh, these are the things that are available to people. Certainly a great opportunity. Well, I think uh, based on what we've been talking about, maybe we give people a little bit of a break and change things up a bit. Shall we? Yes. Would you like to? Yes, absolutely. See these, uh, these beautiful glasses? We're not going to a, we're not going to a, a, a 3D movie. I don't know about you, but I can't see anything. I can't see anything. And pretty good. This, this is, is actually something sad. I was going to read, hopefully be able to read through these, and that's not going to happen. <laughs> what these uh, wonderful glasses uh, are all about is the uh, solar eclipse is coming up on April the 8th. And if you would like to get some glasses, these are safe for direct solar viewing. They are available here in the Camden branch and throughout the uh, all of our Camden County Library District, and we uh, asked that uh, if you want to view the eclipse safely, you can do that. <laughs> but uh, make sure. You, yeah, don't drive it though. Yeah, yeah. This this was something that I had uh, seen on Facebook. Somebody said don't necessarily drive with those on. So we're going to kind of transition into our next topic, and that is talking a little bit about what's going on at some of the other branches of the Camden County Library District. For example, and let me put on these glasses. Go for it. And don't they look beautiful? Uh, I broke my, my good ones, so I had to go to the spares. Climax Springs Library on Saturday, April the 6th, from 10 a.m. to 10.45. They're going to have the Big Sun Small Moon Activity, which sounds like a uh, fun program. Again, getting you familiar with what's going on for the upcoming eclipse, solar eclipse. Max Creek Library on Saturday, April the 6th, from 10 to 10.45. Learn about the solar eclipse. If you don't know what it is, well, you can always Google it, sure. Or you can uh, get some direct information from the folks at the Max Creek Library. On uh, Saturday, April the 6th as well, Sunrise Beach Library from 10.30 uh, to 11.30, they'll be making solar eclipse viewers from, of all things, empty cereal boxes. Everybody in here that's done that, raise your hand. Yes. Right? You bet. Done the, done the cereal box eclipse viewer. You bet. Uh, but if you buy your cereal in a plastic bag, that's not going to work out uh, quite as well. No, no. <laughs> the uh, Camdenton Library on Monday, April the 8th from noon until 5, you can join them for the partial solar eclipse viewing party. <laughs> what, what is, is this? In, will there be drinks? What do we have? Now, Cocktails? <laughs> I've checked into that in the drink cart. You can't do that. No, I see. But, but yeah, we're going to have a good time. Actually, uh, go out and look at this thing with mm -hmm. our glasses. Yeah, and it, it'll be great. You know, an opportunity for you to come in and check out the library and uh, meet some of the folks and... Uh, well, you know, it's the day of the eclipse, so, yeah, we won't be a total eclipse here, but it'll be... It'll be partial. Good. It'll be partial in Missouri. I think, isn't it down towards the southeast where they'll actually get to see the total eclipse? 
m more, more to the, the south, south in uh, countries, countries like Mexico, Mexico and um, I believe down into Central America, they'll have a little bit better opportunity. So uh, this, uh, this party, this solar eclipse, partial solar eclipse viewing party, uh, you'll be watching the solar eclipse and activities for patrons and uh, the public to learn more about the solar eclipse and actually how it works. Essentially, I believe it's when the moon gets in between the Earth and the sun. And beyond that, I'm not an astronomer, so I don't want to delve into uh, the gray matter. When you come in here, we'll teach you about that, how it works. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. perfect. The Osage Beach Library is also going to have uh, some activities on Monday, April the 8th from 1.30 until 2.30. They'll feature informative discussions, a viewing of the uh, partial eclipse and some fun crafts. Then on, uh, it looks here, uh, Saturday, April the 27th from 1 until 2.30, the Lake of the Ozarks Blue Society will be performing right here at the Camden Branch of the CCLD. And to get ready for this, parents, if you're looking to improve your uh, kid's ability to read or you yourself would like to be a part of this, they're going to have the summer reading kickoff party. That happens on Saturday, June 1st from 10 until 2, right here at the Camdenton uh, Library branch in the upper parking lot. Activities, music, a food truck, crafts, vendors, uh, local children's author, Linda Tierney uh, DeMott, I believe is how you pronounce that. Uh, they'll get uh, patrons signed up for the reading challenge and give out prizes. They'll also put the summer reading kickoff party graphic on the screen behind Professor Paisley and I. It's going to be up here eventually. We'll see it. No, never mind. Don't worry about it. That's people coming to the, coming to the uh, summer reading program. Yeah, they are. They're coming all the way from Ellis Island. <laughs> this is a pretty popular program. Another few glitches, right? Gotta love it. So... In addition to all of the things going on, we again direct you to the website, cclb.us. Uh, you can check out the calendar of events and make sure that uh, you keep up with what's going on at your local branch of the CCLD, Camden County Library District. So in addition to immigration, we've had an opportunity to learn a little bit more about something that folks can find out about at the uh, local branch of the CCLD. And that's genealogy. Absolutely. Have you, have you done any uh, looking up the old yes, family, family sure tree? Yes, have. We've, tra we've traced mine all the way back to the tribes of Scotland and the notorious priest of Gretna Green. Now, what he was notorious for, I don't know. I don't think I want to know. But yes, uh, you know, and this is another great opportunity and another example of come into your local library. We've got so many resources here. You know, I know everybody gets on ancestry and that you that's something where you're going to have to pay a fee for it but we have all sorts of di different uh, access to databases we have a lot of uh, information here in the library that that we can give you access to things like uh, cemetery records uh, uh, census records we have a lot of stuff here we have a lot of people that come in uh, just to gain access to old newspapers and that's, those are fascinating. I, I did some research and looked up my dad, James L. Paisley, mm. uh, you know, and it, I, it, I, I was sitting there, you know how it is when you're Googling, you Google your own name. Well, you know, James Paisley, so I, I typed it in there and looked at it, sure enough, it came up, and it was the Columbia, Missourian, and it was my dad, three years old, sitting on the curb on Broadway in Columbia, watching the Christmas parade. And he had a little sailor outfit on, you know, and I thought, how cool is that? So, you know, it, there's so many different things that we can help you gain access to. And again, that's why we're here. We're here to help educate the public. And, and man, you know, it's hard sometimes. You can hit a dead end on, your, on genealogy. And we have people here on the staff that do it all the time. And they can, they can break through those hurdles for you and, and help you gain even more information and help you to look in places that you never even thought of. Um, so, like I said, we have something called Her Heritage Quest. We've got uh, uh, another one, Missouri Digital Heritage. Mm -hmm. um, we have access to some things that most people just can't can't grab off the internet. And again, the nice thing is, is <clears throat> we have people here that can steer you in the right direction. You know, because not everything you read on Google is true, believe it or not, right? And so we can help you with that. A couple of the different ways that people can access information, you can go to cclb.us, genealogy, G-E-N-E-A-L-O-G-Y, or is it O-L-O-G-Y, genealogy, no, it's A-L-O-G-Y. It's spelled right here in front of me, so anyway, and I also took the time to uh, go to this particular portion of your uh, website, uh, the website here, 
And it talks about, obviously, some things that you can do to discover your roots, learn how to use Ancestry and Heritage Quest, as uh, the good professor mentioned. And then it says here on the uh, second Monday of each month, from 9 until 10.30, you can discover your roots and learn, again, how to use Ancestry and Heritage Quest. Yes, and that, you know, we, we utilize the computer lab here. We've got a room in there where you can sit down in a quiet atmosphere and, and do that research, and we have people here that can help you do it. And when you go to the, uh, when you go to the particular page on the website, uh, you scroll down, and there is a form all the way at the bottom. And it is a ways down there. But essentially, what you can do, they've got uh, the genealogy and obituary request forms. Uh, genealogy request, name, uh, what branch, telephone number, email, some things that you are required to put in there, but other things that you don't have to come up with. And then uh, also the obituary request, because I think everybody kind of likes to know sometimes about uh, family history, who lived here, where they lived, when they lived, the uh, different family members, and of course when they passed. But these are all things that are available to you by going to the ccld.us website. And uh, these things are available, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, just a, a great resource and a great opportunity to find out more. Now, does your uh, particular family tree have branches? It's got branches, a lot of them. Mine, Mine looks like, like a telephone pole. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Apple doesn't fall far from the tree as far as we're concerned. Yeah. Um, and you know, KB, you bring up another good point is, is what we can do is help you in some of that research, like you brought up the, the thing of the obituaries. Well, uh, there have been people for years have uh, just volunteer groups that have gone out and collected data from all the cemeteries, uh, you know, throughout Missouri. And we can show you how to gain access to that and actually steer you to where that plot is, where that person is today. And it, it's pretty handy because a lot of them uh, were just little church cemeteries. Uh, there was, uh, there's a, there, some of you may be familiar, there's a little uh, cemetery across from uh, like where uh, Little Rizzo's is on HH mm -hmm. there. That used to be a, a church right there. And the, the road was just a gravel road across the street was a cemetery for that particular church. And interestingly enough, somebody went out there and did all the research on it. And, and there's a lot of the, the tombstones have long since disintegrated or disappeared. Mm -hmm. But they've done the research, and there's like 30 slaves that are buried there. There's all sorts of people uh, from the early 1800s that, uh, you know, attended that church and are buried in that cemetery, but they're in unmarked graves now. So somebody took the time to do all of the research, and those are available nationwide and statewide. Here in our state, we've done a great job of collecting that information. I have family up in, in a little town that's called Littleby, Missouri, mm -hmm. and it's between Mexico and Ladonia. Well, the town doesn't exist anymore. It was just a whistle stop, but sure enough, found the records here, told me where that was, and we drove up there and saw it. It's, you know, it's pretty cool. You remember the program we did on Lake TV a while back, you, me, Bill Mulder, out of the church off of Oro. Oh, absolutely, yes. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, my, uh, my family, my great-great-grandfather, he, uh, he had a farm where Mill Creek is today, up the Gravoy Arm, and when the lake filled, it flooded his farm. And uh, basically, I've got pictures of, of my grandfather standing there as the lake's coming up, but he helped build the church uh, there at, on O Road, that St. Patrick's, the original St. Patrick's Church. And my family, uh, that side of my family is buried in that cemetery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, again, you know, it's, it's fascinating when you start looking into the history. It, it's pretty cool to be able to go and, and see the actual places where, where they lived. Uh, like I say, the, you know, his name's on the corner of the, of the church itself. And uh, he's buried there in that cemetery. So, again, we can help you with that. We can steer you in the right direction. We've got the people here. We have the resources. Uh, so it's kind of a fun kind of thing to do. Well, what's interesting about that is living here at the Lake of the Ozarks, we know that cemeteries were relocated. Mm -hmm. We know about the town of Lynn Creek being relocated. Uh, I think it's on its third run. Right. And, you know, somebody had to take the opportunity to document all that. And, and, and as those graves were exhumed and moved somewhere else, hopefully, hopefully now, uh, because it was a very interesting time when they decided to build the lake, and everything that was kind of in the way. 
and some stuff you can bulldoze, but we hope that cemeteries weren't necessarily bulldozed over. And uh, there is one particular cemetery, and, and I don't know if this sounds weird to people or not, but I actually enjoy visiting some of the old cemeteries to see some of the, the grave markers, Absolutely. the headstones. Yep. I mean, we've got people around here that participated in the Civil War, and before that and after that. Mm -hmm. And you see the military grave sites and these, these different family names that maybe you're driving by uh, a business in Camden and you see a name and how long that family has been established here at the Lake of the Ozarks. It's fascinating. It is. It's it just is. really wild. And, you know, being a historian in my life, I drive her crazy most of the time, but we went to the Oktoberfest one time and I said, we need to go to the cemetery. She's like, I came here to drink wine and, you know, dance. And well, I drug her over there. And sure enough, there's a great big tombstone there and it had a skull and crossbones on it. In Herman, Missouri, I thought, what in the world? So I did a research on it, and there was a steamboat that exploded. It was the largest maritime disaster in the United States at the time. It was back in the 1800s. The thing blew up. Mm -hmm. They didn't know who anybody, anybody was on it because guess what? It was immigrants, right? Anyhow, it had like 350 people on it. It blew up, killed them all, and they didn't know what to do with them, so they buried them in a mass grave. And because it was a maritime disaster, they put the skull and crossbones on it. So there's a lot of history in these places, a lot of stories, you know, and I just found that fascinating, you know. Of course, my wife said, can we go get a glass of wine now, right? But, yeah. You're in Herman. We were in Herman. Exactly. Yeah. But you're exactly right. Um, I mean, again, uh, the neat thing about doing genealogy, is it'll take you down uh, some rabbit holes and you get to find out, you know, don't just look at who the people are. Take the time to say, okay, what was it like when they were living there? What was it like to live in Mill Creek in 1840, you know, with a sawmill? You know, we're sitting there worrying because the air conditioner is not working on the car, and these people are in some little hut out there scratching out a living. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, again, take the time to look at, at why, uh, what it was like during that period of time. If they're coming from Europe, take the time to do the research, and we can help you with that, as to what was happening in, in Germany uh, in, in 1830, uh, or in France at that time, or Italy, wherever they came from, there's a story there. And Absolutely. We, we can help you find it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm KB, and this is Professor Jim Paisley, who is, by the way, I don't think we gave you your props, the uh, new director of the Camden County Library District, and has been doing everything and anything he can possibly do, turning over stones, yep. shaking the trees, yep. seeing what he could do to get the word out about the, uh, the library because it is a fascinating place and I'm sure that you have spent a lot of your time as a professor doing hours upon hours upon hours of research and of course the internet available here so if people want to come in and, and do research or the gentleman we've talked about as far as doing genealogy, his name is John mm -hmm. and from what I understand in talking with Coley that he's extremely extremely on top of this gig and can do some pretty amazing things. So we've got uh, a few minutes left in the program. We wanted to kind of go for full circle with this. And I don't know if anybody out there in our audience or anybody online has any questions for us, but in listening to you talk, I was, uh, I was uh, at a point where my curiosity was piqued on a couple of different things that you discussed. And now this, uh, this whole topic of citizenship. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you mentioned at one point it was, what, two to five years? Yes. And then at another point it was 14 years right. before you could become a citizen. Right. So what did you do during that particular time? What were some of the things that were required of you to become a citizen? Well, again, a lot of those people that came in came as indentured servants, mm -hmm. which meant, you know, you're, you want to get here, but passage was very expensive. It wasn't a cheap thing to do. Right. And so... Uh, they would sign a contract, and usually the the ship captain he acted like the uh, the middleman. Yeah. And basically, here in America, people would say, "Go get me some people. I need four <laughs> people to work people. on my farm." Right. And there were people standing on the docks there in, in Europe, wherever the ship was at, and, and they would he'd say, "Okay, you four, and he'd put them on the boat, take them there, and deliver them." And then he got a cut. But basically, that was they were trading if you will, in, in workers. Um, once the people came here, they had contracts. Some of them went as long as 10 years, five to 10 years where you worked that farm. And at the end of that five to 10 years, you turned around and then gained 
your, your independence, okay? But until then, you were an indentured servant and you had a contract that you had to fulfill. Bear in mind, if you don't fulfill your contract, off to debtor's prison you went. Um, the nice thing about it, though, was in most cases what we saw happen is because people here were recruiting people to come, they'd say, if you come, they'd sweeten the pot. They'd say, if you come here and work for me for 10 years, I'll give you 200 acres of land when you're done, too. Right. And that's how a lot of our, our forefathers and our ancestors wound up getting that first piece of property here in America. Because in Europe, nearly all the property was held by, by the elites. And you know, it, it was almost impossible to gain property. They also had problems in, in Europe and that they had uh, a practice called primogenitor, mm -hmm. which the oldest kid wound up getting the land. And, and so now here you are, you're a family of eight kids. Guess what? You have an older brother. Guess who gets the land? What are you going to do, dude? And so what would happen is a lot of these people who transferred and came here to America came as a result of that law. Once they got here, you know, there was all this land available. And so, you know, they'd come in here and climb to the top of the first hill, and they'd say, my gosh, look at all this. And they said, yeah, it just keeps going. We don't even know how far it goes. Thomas Jefferson, when he sent out Lewis and Clark uh, on their expedition, he asked for two things. He said, bring me back a unicorn, and he said, to be careful for dinosaurs. He honestly believed that. Yeah, and they did. They looked for unicorns, never found one. But, you know, they sent everything else back. Uh, never found any dinosaurs either. But... Uh, Again, Again, that's, that's how, how much, much we knew about the western part of the United States. And so there was plenty of land, you know, and all you had to do was, was be willing to go out there and try it. You know, go west, young man, and that's what a lot of people did. Uh, but again, uh, the biggest part of the problem was coming up with the funds just to get here. And so huge numbers of people came in under these types of contracts. You touched on the, uh, I guess, the follow-up question. Did the indentured servants always get released from their yes. contracts? And uh, you mentioned the fact that they received, in some cases, not every case, they received land and or maybe a, a little startup money, seed money, if you will. But for those who didn't, what did those people do when they were let out of their contract because they had been working for this particular person? another great question, and I thought it was interesting. If you were, could come with the credentials of being a proper white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you stayed pretty much in New England, you could get a job. But if you came in here as a Catholic fleeing Germany, or you came in as an Irishman, they literally put signs up that said, need not apply, okay? And so what happened to those people? Because they couldn't get jobs up north, okay? Because they wouldn't, you know, their, their ethnicity. And they couldn't get a job down south because the south was already bringing in slave labor. So you can't compete with that. They're working for free. So what happened to them? They wound up in the middle there. And they wound up in places like Kentucky and Tennessee. And they wound up there because that's the only place left. All right? And folks, go back and look at your family tree. See how many of them from here in Missouri came from Kentucky? Well, the reason why they were in Kentucky is because nobody else wanted them. And so they wound up in Kentucky. You had people like Daniel Boone, good Missouri boy, all right? And Daniel Boone eventually led folks out of Kentucky into, into Missouri, of all places, mm -hmm. okay? And sure enough, that's how most of our, our uh, citizens here in Missouri got their start. A, a huge percentage of them came out of Kentucky. But again, they, they came out of Europe because nobody wanted them. They came out of Kentucky because nobody wanted them to the north or south, and they wound up in Missouri. And I'm happy to have them. Right? And you know, you mentioned the Irish. Um, they ended up doing a lot of jobs. You hear about the O'Shaughnessy's and the O'Malley's uh, being firefighters mm -hmm. and police officers. Those were the jobs. I mean, at that time, uh, most people asked the same question that they asked today. Why would somebody run into a burning building? Well, that's because it was a job. Yes. And if you look at the history of uh, especially firefighting, <laughs> they didn't have what they have today. No. Uh, if uh, they had a, a horse and, and, and a buggy with some water on it, they were lucky. And things like bucket brigades, and you talk about, they used whatever means were available to fight fires. And I'm sure a lot of them died in the process because, <laughs> as is the case now, you've got rules, you've got regulations, you've got things that you're supposed to do.
Interestingly enough, you were talking as we uh, get ready to wrap things up about uh, another area we might look into, and that's the Santa Fe Trail. But uh, as we uh, get ready to uh, wrap this uh, particular broadcast up, I want to thank all of the folks that made it possible. We've got uh, Mark Massey and Coley Creech, Vicki Graneman, the great staff here at the Camperton Branch, and all of the uh, folks that work for the CCLD. Again, check out the website, CCLDUS, or .US. We want to thank our friends over at SRG Financial Advisors, Lake TV, and certainly our in-studio audience and all of you that are watching online. Our next show comes your way from this particular location. I believe it's going to be on April the 11th. We'll be talking of all things Ukraine and Russia. You bet. Looking forward to it. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Wrapping up the Chapter and Chatter Cafe right here from the Camden branch of the Camden County Library District. Be safe, folks. God bless, and thanks for tuning in.